Good morning, Calvary. Would you guys stand and join us for worship? To the King of 
This comes from Matthew chapter 16. And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. And what good will it be for a man if he gains the whole world and yet forfeits his soul? For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. God, we come to the end of ourselves. And God, would you be glorified upon it? Would our life be consumed by praise and worship and desperation for more of your presence in our midst? God, forgive us when we grow complacent. us tender to your heart, tender to your love. God, open our ears to hear your voice above all the other noise. Jesus, we don't want a performance. We need your presence. So would you come and change everything? God, show us what it means to lose our lives and be consumed by all that you are. To abandon it all in pursuit of more of you. So God, we open our arms as we open the story of our lives, the book of our lives. And God, it's your story. Would you write your story upon our lives? Jesus, come and have your way. Walk us with you through your death and into your resurrection, a new life of communion with you, of unity with you, connection. God, would we be willing to risk it all, to abandon it all for your sake? In Jesus' name.
Everybody, happy Sunday. It's a beautiful day out. I hope you get to go out and enjoy it. Um, as many of you know, uh, we continue on in our worship throughout the entirety of the service in a, in a multitude of ways. But one way is by giving of our tithes and our offerings. Um, it's, a, it's a way that we surrender and put God first by giving him the first fruits of our lives in every area. Um, so if you would like to participate this morning in the mission of Calvary and what God is doing in this place, in our community, um, and in his and his children all around the world. We would love for you to participate. Um, you can do so in a couple of ways. There are some QR codes on the back of your pews. Otherwise, there's a couple of black boxes on your right side of the, on your way outside of the worship center. Or you can always head over to calvary.org slash give. And would you join me in praying for the offering this morning? God, we're so thankful for every opportunity to, to come before you and to put you first, to express what has been revealed to us that you're good and you're worthy of all of our praise, of all of our lives. So God, would you come and consume us? Would you bless the gifts that we have to offer you today, the worship that we have to bestow before you? Because that's really all that it is, right? It's all, it's all worship. And God, we're just so thankful for what you're doing in this place in the lives of, of all of your children here in our midst um, and in our community. And God, what a gift it is to participate in. In Jesus' name. Confirmation service, and we have a bunch of students that will be confirming their faith. If you're not familiar with the confirmation process, 
You know, many kids are baptized before they can even remember it. And we believe that that's a covenant that God makes with kids and parents speak on behalf of their children, that they're gonna raise their kids to know Jesus and to put the scriptures in their hands and they're gonna come to worship and all of those important discipleship things. But there comes a time in our life where every one of us has to take responsibility for our faith. We need to say yes to Jesus on our own. And so that's really what confirmation is all about. And so these students have come faithfully to to classes and worship services on Wednesday nights. We have an incredible youth program. There's been mentoring opportunities. There's been small group leaders who have poured into these students. And now it comes to the time where they can publicly stand before our congregation and say, yes, I want to follow Jesus. And so This afternoon, again, at one o'clock, we'll have a service. And if you are available to come and support and encourage these students, we would invite you and we would love for you to come and be a part of that. But also we know a bunch of those students are at this service. And so we wanna take the opportunity to pray a blessing for them. So if you are one of the confirmation students that will be confirming our faith this afternoon, I'm just gonna ask that you stand where you're at if you could. Awesome. Now we're so, so excited for you and we wanna pray a prayer of blessing for you. So if everybody could reach out a hand of blessing and maybe your families could lay a hand on your student and let's pray together. So God, we're so thankful for your love and your grace and how you pursue us with a relationship, how you want us to be a part of your family and to be active followers of your son, Jesus. And so God, we give thanks for this special day where these students will stand before our congregation and where they will say yes to following you. And God, we ask that you surround them with your love, your grace, your peace, your confidence, that you would make them always, always know that they are your beloved children and help them each day to follow closely to you. Help uh, give them grace when they make mistakes like we all do and every day reassure them of your amazing, amazing love and grace for them. And so we ask that you lift them up. We pray for the families and friends that will be here to support them. And God, it's such a great day as we see these students take another step of faith and make a commitment to you. So God, we pray this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus. And let's all say together, amen. All right, thank you so much for standing up. And again, we'd love to see you this afternoon at 1 p.m. Take a look at this video. Well, good morning. Welcome to Worship at Calvary. I want to welcome all of our campuses, everybody that has joined us this morning. So all of you here in the Worship Center, everyone over in the chapel, everyone at our Minnetonka campus, and then anyone who is watching online. We're so, so glad that you are with us as we continue on in this sermon series that is really about how we can form healthier and stronger relationships in all parts of our life. Now, I think typically we have no problem actively pursuing something that we want really, really bad. If you have a vision for something in your life, you are going to take steps to try to move forward. You're going to try to be more intentional. You are going to try to pursue that goal that you have on your heart. So for instance, if you want to pursue an opportunity at work, you know you can't just sit back and coast, right? You're going to take some positive steps. You're going to try to volunteer to do some extra things. You're going to try to be present and be around people 
people who have influence. You're gonna try to network with other people. You're gonna try to go the extra mile. If you're trying to pursue a new friendship, well, you might try a new activity that you've never done before. You're gonna make an extra effort to check in and to communicate maybe with the person that you're hoping to develop the friendship with. If you're trying to pursue a healthier lifestyle, you might get on some sort of workout plan. You're gonna watch your your nutrition more carefully. You're gonna be more intentional about what goes into your body. If you're trying to pursue a significant other, you're gonna do anything you can do to spend time together, to show your love and affection and your devotion to the other person. You're gonna do everything you can to get to know that person even better. Now, when I was dating my wife, Lexi, I found out that she loved to play softball. Like most of her family was on a softball team. Like I really could care less about softball, but I went to every single one of her softball games that I could and sat with her dad and we cheered him on. In the same way, when I found out that she sang on her church's Saturday worship team, Like I usually didn't have a desire to go to Saturday worship, but I was in church every Saturday because I was pursuing a relationship with her. I wanted to know her favorite restaurant. I wanted to know her favorite movies, her favorite music. You know, when we are pursuing a relationship with someone, we're especially in tune to the things that they love, what they value, what's especially close to their hearts. And it might be completely different stuff than we would naturally gravitate towards. Like it might even be things that we would never imagine listening to or watching or being a part of, but because we are drawn to the other person, we wanna build a closer relationship with them. We wanna continue to pursue them. Now, maybe you have some similar stories in your life. Maybe there was a time when you drove through the night just so you could spend a little time with your person. Maybe you went out of your way to spend way more money than you should have to buy concert tickets to that performer that that person you were pursuing really wanted to see in concert. Or maybe you remember how you could talk on the phone for hours, just appreciating hearing each other's voice. But you know, on the flip side, I think we probably all know what it's like to reach a part of our relationship or our marriage where things start to feel routine. Maybe we start to feel more distant and disconnected. And we wonder what in the world has happened? This is not at all what it was like in the beginning. And you know, one good possibility, one of the reasons that we might feel that way is that we have stopped pursuing each other. We've stopped being as intentional and thoughtful as we once were. And, you know, instinctively, I think we know that that is a bad recipe for relationships. It's almost never possible to do nothing and get better, right? There's very few things in life that you can just sit back and instantly they're going to improve. We know that we have to be intentional. We have to take positive steps, Good things typically don't happen by default. Now, I remember very, very little from physics class back in high school, but I still remember Newton's first law of motion. You might remember this. It's the one that says objects in motion tend to stay in motion. Objects at rest tend to stay at rest unless acted upon by an outside force. And you know what? I think that law actually is a great explanation of our relationships. It describes other parts of our lives that if we let things stop, if we let things coast, if we take things for granted, they very rarely improve and get better. When our relationships lose momentum, when our relationships lose commitment, when they lose priority, in our lives, they tend to stay at rest, they become stale, they become atrophied, and they become damaged. So whether it's our body, whether it's our business, whether it's our backyard lawn, whether it's our relationships or our marriages, it typically means that we need to actively pursue a better future through commitment and hard work in order to move forward. So again, we're in a sermon series called Committed Relationships. 
You see, healthy and strong marriages, as well as friendships and any other relationship, they don't happen by accident. At their core, they require a lot of commitment. And so in this series, we're looking at four important commitments that we can make in order to build healthier and stronger marriages and relationships and friendships. And those commitments are this, the commitment of priority, the commitment of pursuit, the commitment of partnership, and the commitment of honesty. So last week, if you were here, Pastor Dogney did a fantastic job starting with our first commitment, the commitment of priority, where we say, I promise that God will be my first priority. Now it sounds really basic, but it's really easy to get this out of order. Oftentimes we put ourselves first, oftentimes we put others first, but God is supposed to be the first in our life. When God is first, then we put our relationships second, and it's the order that God created us to live into. Today, I wanna talk about our second commitment, which is a commitment to pursuit, where we say, I promise to continue to pursue the person or the people that I love. You know, from the very beginning, God has been pursuing us. After Adam and Eve sinned against God, their first instinct was to run away and to try to hide from him. But you see, God loved to walk through the garden every afternoon. He loved to spend time with his beloved creation. And so in chapter two, verse nine, God pursues them. Even as they're hiding, he calls out to them, where are you? And you might notice he doesn't accuse them. He doesn't critique them. No, his first thing that he does is he pursues them. Where have you gone? You don't need to hide. I'm still here. I'm not turning my back on you. So in just the few, few first chapters of the Bible, we see that God at his core is a God who pursues. Even when we try to separate ourselves, even when we try to flee, even when we sin against him, God still pursues us. Now, if you were here on Easter Sunday, we looked at depth, in depth at Luke chapter 15, which is a series of parables that Jesus told three things that were lost. He talks about a lost sheep and a lost coin and a lost son. And we were reminded that Jesus said his mission on earth was to seek and to save the lost, that Jesus came to pursue people who are distant from God. And in telling those stories, he gives a picture of what he's all about, that he would leave 99 to go find one lost person. And that when he finds lost people, his arms are open wide like the father in the prodigal son story. And he welcomes us back into relationship because he is a God who pursues. God's passionate and relentless pursuit of us stopped at nothing. It led to him sending his only son, Jesus, to actually die on the cross for you and for me. It's because we could never figure it out on our own. We could never get our act together enough to work our way into God's good graces. And so he took the initiative. He did all the hard work. He came all the way down in pursuit of you and me. Now, the amazing thing about God's heart and his mission is that he still pursues us when we are stubborn and when we are stuck, or even, I love the word that Isaiah uses, even when we're obstinate. Look at Isaiah 65. This is what God says. He says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me to a nation that did not call on my name. I said, here I am, here I am. All day long, I have held out my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imaginations. God had every reason under the sun to just go away, to just give up. But what he says is he's not gonna stop pursuing the people that he loves. He's on a mission to seek and to save the lost. So Jesus continued that mission, that pursuit of people. 
And then after his death and his resurrection, he gathered his followers and he said, all right, now you guys are a part of this pursuit, this mission. He says, go and make disciples. He says, go and be my witnesses. You are to pursue people on my behalf. Now, the reality is when we follow him, we all fall short, right? We all make mistakes. And yet he still pursues us through the Holy Spirit. He reminds us of his love and his grace and his patience. And all the while, he slowly transforms us into the image of Jesus. Now, church, can you think of anything more amazing than the truth that you are the object of the God of heaven's pursuit? that of all the things he could occupy his time with, of all the things he could set his heart upon, he is pursuing you. You are worthy of his creativity and his power and his persistence. And so when it comes to our relationships, our marriages, our friendships and all the rest, well, they won't grow and they won't be healthy. And sadly, Many times they won't even last if we don't have a commitment to pursuit. Now in Genesis, God invents the institution of marriage between the first man and the first woman. And in Genesis 2.24, it says this, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Now, the word I want to focus on there is the word united. It's not surprising that it's there. It's kind of predictable, right? In a close marriage, you'd expect that the people would feel and be united. Marriage is the uniting of two people into a covenant relationship. But you see, the word united there is actually much more deep and complex than first meets the eye. It's the Hebrew word dabak. And it shows up all throughout the Old Testament. And it has a lot more than just our initial maybe vision of what being united means. It actually means to cling to each other or to stick close to, but it also can be defined as pursuing closely or pursuing hard after someone. You see, it's an active, not a passive idea. Again, it's a great word to describe the lengths that God goes for each one of us, but it's also the way that we are to treat our relationships. Let's look at a few other places in the Old Testament where this word dabak is used. Psalm 63, verse eight, two different translations. I follow close to you. My soul pursues you. It's a description of our heart's posture, our soul's posture towards God. Let's look at the book of Job. This is in the context of relationships. They are joined fast to one another. They cling together and cannot be parted. Or let's look at the book of Judges, Judges 20, where it says, this is more in the context of an army, but it says, then they pursued them relentlessly. So to follow closely, to pursue relentlessly, to be joined fast, to be united, that is what our souls need and what they long for. Now, one of my very favorite Bible stories to illustrate this idea of pursuing in a relationship is the story of Jacob and Rachel. There were two sisters. Leah was the name of the older sister and Rachel is the name of the younger sister. And this is what the Bible actually says. Look at Genesis 29, 17. It says, Leah had very weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Can you believe that that is the description we're given of these two women? Moses, out of all the things he could have said, he's like, Rachel is gorgeous and Leah needs glasses. Or, you know, like you could think Moses, he could have at least said she had a nice personality, right? But no. He's pretty blunt. So Jacob comes along and he falls in love with Rachel and he wants to marry her and he will do absolutely anything to 
do this. So her father, her father Laban says, I'll take that deal. You work for me for seven years, and then you can have Rachel's hand in marriage. And so that's exactly what Jacob did. He worked for seven years and the time flew by because he just had all of these visions of his love for Rachel. And so seven years happen and he's ready. He wants to be married to Rachel, yet Laban conned Jacob. He said, no, actually you can marry Leah, not Rachel. And Jacob's like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. That was not the deal. What are you trying to pull? And Laban said, well, you know, it's customary in our culture that the oldest daughter gets to marry first. So we're just trying to follow cultural norms. But Jacob is still resolute because of his deep love for Rachel. He's still intent on winning her hand. Now, a lot of people think what happens next is that he works another seven years before he's able to marry Rachel. But actually what happened is Laban gave Rachel to him to be married, but then said, you now owe me another seven years of hard labor. So think for a moment of Jacob's incredible commitment and pursuit of Rachel. Jacob was willing to work for Rachel even after he already was married to her. After he had already received the gift that he desired, he was still willing to pursue her. And you know what? I think in many ways, that's the same heart that God wants us to have in our marriages, in our relationships, to be willing to continue to pursue the people that we love, to go the extra mile, to be intentional, to be thoughtful. You know, when you're dating someone or when a friendship is new and fresh, think in those times we are willing to go above and beyond to try to pursue the other person. You're willing to do the little things. You know, maybe it's to write a love note to the person that you're dating. Maybe it's sending some really thoughtful texts. I remember when Lexi and I started dating, I tried to put together like the best mixtape ever. But it was a little bit after tape, so it was like when we still burn CDs. You remember that? So it was like love song, love song, worship song, love song, air supply, maybe journey, faithfully. I don't know what it was all on there. Definitely whatever it was, it would destroy my indie rock loving cred for sure. But I didn't care because I was pursuing her. But you know what happens to way too many people is once we get married, once the relationship has lasted for a while, the desire to pursue each other tends to fade away. There's so much busyness, distractions. It's easy to take each other for granted. Maybe kids come along or there's more responsibilities at work. Now, I've done a lot of weddings throughout my 20 plus years of ministry. And I've yet to have a couple during pre-marriage counseling who said, you know, our goal is to end up having a bad marriage. You know, like we wanna have 10 strong years and then we're gonna grow apart and then we're just gonna split everything we have up and go our separate ways. Nobody has ever said that. Nobody wants that for their future, right? We all start out with good intentions. We love each other, but life wears us down. We want to show our love for each other, but Oftentimes we don't do it. So this morning, I wanna share three basic principles that will help us live out our commitment of pursuit. These are three simple principles that really help us close the gap between our intention and our action, right? Close the gap between what we intend to do and the actions that we really truly take. Now, I heard these principles first articulated by a pastor named Craig Groeschel. And I want to admit to you right up front, I am not an expert on these things. So I am as convicted or more so than all of you. When it comes to these things, these are things I have not figured out, but I want to grow in them. And I hope you do too. And I can hear Lexi saying right now, amen to that, right? So the first principle is this, when you think of something good, say it. 
mean, it sounds so simple and basic, right? But how often do we not actually do it? When you think of something good about the other person, be willing to say it. Hebrews 3.13 says, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. If you want to keep the deceitfulness of sin outside of your marriage, outside of your friendship, outside of whatever relationship it is, then find ways to encourage one another and to lift each other up daily. Don't put it off. Don't wait for birthdays or some greeting card holiday to come around. Every time you think of something good, say it. It's worth it. The other person needs to hear it. But think of how many times something good comes into your head and then you fail to ever share it. I know for me, it literally happens all the time. So I wanna talk in generalities for just a moment. Try not to be offended by it. I know every one of us is created unique and different and you might gravitate towards one side or the other and that's okay. But I'm just gonna talk in very um, general terms about our gender. So first, I wanna talk to all the guys out there because when it comes to your significant other, you need to pursue her with words of affection. Now don't get the wrong idea, guys. These are non-sexual words of affection, all right? Now, one practical way to do this is to simply add a word, all right? You say the first three words, I love you, add a fourth word, because. I love you because. I love you because of how caring you are. I love you because of how great you are with our kids. I love you because of your smile. Pursue her with words of affection because it instills tremendous value and blessing into her life. Now, ladies, pursue him with words of affirmation. Now, probably all of us can remember times in our life when someone has specifically been good at pointing out what we're not good at. You're not good enough. You're not talented enough. You'll never figure it out. But you know, when someone sees the potential in us and calls it out, we tend to rise to the occasion. And so tell him what you see him becoming, especially spiritually. Affirm the steps of faith that he's taking for your family. I appreciated that prayer that you prayed during dinner. I so appreciate that we make worship on Sunday mornings of value for our family. Find word, words of affirmation. And again, all of us need affection, all of us need affirmation but in a very general way, this is just so important. And really what the questions that are most essential are this, men, women need to know, do you love me today? And women, what he needs to know, do you believe in me today? When you think of something, something good, say it. Number two, when you think of something special, do it. James 4.17 says something that I think can loosely be applied to our relationships. It says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and then doesn't do it, it is the sin for them. Anytime you think of something good, something that you can do to be a blessing to someone else, do it. Maybe it's coming home from work early and cleaning up the house. Maybe it's bringing home takeout on a really busy day. Maybe it's just saying, hey, let's go outside on this beautiful day and take a walk, or let's buy tickets to that show or that game that you really wanna go to. Or maybe you look towards your spouse or your friend or a neighbor, and you see that they're especially stressed out. It's an overwhelming week. Maybe things are going terribly, and instinctively we know that there are things that we could do to help. So maybe it's emptying the dishwasher, getting the kids ready for bed. Maybe it's sending over flowers Maybe it's planning a getaway. Maybe it's just doing something that your spouse would especially love to do. Like watch a chick flick instead of an action flick. Maybe it's not getting fast food for once and going and getting some sushi or something else a little better. Think of something special, be a blessing, and then do it. 
Again, I think this is oftentimes things that we know we should do, but for a variety of reasons, we failed to do it. Well, then third and finally, when we want something different, be it. (coughs) See, I think the tendency in any of these relationship series is to diagnose everyone else. You know who needs to hear this? Did you hear point number two? No, this should be all about us first. We need to own it personally because we need to become the people that God wants us to become. We can't change anyone else, but we can open ourselves up to God's power and transformation. We can be made new. Ezekiel 36 says, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove you from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. It starts with us first. Now, maybe some of you are like me and you kind of bristle when you're told what to do. That's probably my control issues. But you know what? When I see Lexi doing something, especially intentional, you know, maybe it's putting her phone away so she can be more present with our kids and me. Maybe it's just something else that she does very thoughtfully. Well, then suddenly that example is expiring, right? Suddenly I want to be more attentive and I want to be more present. And again, we can't change anyone else, but we can change ourselves. And when we model what we are hoping, well, then it inspires the others who are closest to us. So again, church, our second commitment is a commitment of pursuits to say, I promise to continue to pursue the person or the people that I love. We're not gonna be content to let our relationships go stale. And what I wanna close with is this reminder, to get what you once had, you must do what you once did. You might remember a season in any one of your relationships where you were especially connected and you felt close and there was an abundance of love. And you might be thinking today, what in the world happened? But remember to get what you once had, you have to do what you once did. You had it before, you can get it again. And you actually know what to do. You need to be intentional and you need to be creative and you need to be thoughtful like you once were. You need to recommit to pursuing your spouse, your friend, your kids, your grandkids, whomever it is that you want a closer relationship with. So again, remember church, first, our commitment of making God our priority. And now second, a commitment to pursue the people that we love. Let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you are a God who pursues us relentlessly, that you don't give up on us even though you have every reason to do so, that even despite our sin and our stubbornness, you pursue us with your love and your grace and ultimately with Jesus. God, help us to remember to be committed to pursuit in our relationships, to not let things go stale, to not take people for granted, but instead to be intentional, to be thoughtful, to be proactive. God, help us day by day to pursue the people that we love. So we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus and let's all say together. Would you guys stand and join us for worship?
Be blessed.